Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate everybody coming today, and I know how much fun it is to visit because that's what I like to do. But we want to start on time so we can end on time so everybody can move on with their day. My name is Jeff Mason, and I am a graduate of the University of Colorado Boulder from the last millennium, maybe like some of the, <laughs> some of the rest of us here. And um, I'm on the board for the Denver area alumni. We're a 501c3 group. We take whatever funds we can gather after we've paid the bills for an event like this or our watch parties, and we use that as a donation, as a scholarship, or as the fund for scholarships that we give each spring to Denver area students who are already enrolled at CU. And so a turnout like this warms my heart, and I thank you all for being here. We started partnering with the CU Advocates, and our numbers have grown tremendously. Michelle McKinney has been a great help in getting to the breadth and depth of good sources to do presentations like this. But I want to thank you all for being here. We also have a watch party that's coming up this Saturday at the Tavern down in um, DTC, which will be a fundraiser for us. And then we have other events, like a music event that happens in March. These are things that you can find by going to the CU Alumni webpage and then find our specific page for the Denver Area Alumni where we list all of our events. Once again, thank you for being here, and I'll turn this over to Michelle. Okay, so we can get on with our program. My name is Michelle McKinney. I'm the director of the CU Advocates Program, which is based in the Office of the President. And I have the privilege of doing these programs that represent the value and the work and the contributions that all of our CU campuses do. The event, uh, I mean the program for Advocates is about three years old. We celebrated our third anniversary on October 7th and we named our 2014 CU Advocate of the Year who happens to be here, George Brammer. Will you please stand up? Congratulations again. Uh, we have monthly programs such as this, and all of our programs for the last few years have reached about 3,600 people around the state, and we're proud to partner with the alumni chapter and hope to partner with other alumni chapters with the CU campuses in the future. I'd like to welcome CU Regent Steve Bosley. Please stand up and say hello. <clears throat> Steve Bosley is an at-large region. He's been elected and he represents the entire state of Colorado. I'd also like to recognize CU Region Emeritus Paul Schauer. Hello, Paul. <clears throat> and then we are very fortunate to have what many people, who many people call the First Lady of the University of Colorado, and that's Marcy Benson. Uh, as, an, as a director of an advocates program, she truly is a tireless advocate for the University of Colorado. She does have uh, several passions that she's dedicated her resources, her time to, which is the Health and Wellness Center on the CU Anschutz Medical Campus and the Alzheimer's research that's being done at the Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, she serves on so many boards, there are too many to list, but she is engaged with CU on as many levels as you can imagine. And her, her and her husband, Bruce Benson, who's the president, um, just so you know, they have uh, co-chaired two Billion, over billion dollar campaigns, the um, Beyond Boundaries campaign, which was in 1997, which was very successful. And then we just wrapped up about a year and a half ago the Creating Futures campaign where they co-chaired that as well. So we are indebted very much to Bruce and Marcy. Um, as you know, like I said, Alzheimer's research is a passion of Marcy's. It's very close to her heart. Um, her mother suffered from Alzheimer's for about 12 years and um, she'll shed some light on that. And it's my pleasure right now to introduce Marcy Benson. Thank you. I'm obviously shorter than her that I can stand up straight and use this mic. Now, before I introduce the two people I'm going to talk about today, I just have to comment on Michelle. I know a, a lot of people, a lot of you know Michelle and know how great she is, but I just want Michelle and all of you to know that Bruce just thinks she's one of the best things that ever happened to see you. So feel very grateful that she is in charge of you, and we are delighted to have her with us. So let's clap.
And now, before I introduce Hunt Potter, we have a very special guest with us today, Anna, New Anna Newman. If you will come up here, please. And also introduce her parents, because we want to give them some credit, too, who are sitting here. Wave so everybody knows who you are. Okay. All right. Anna is a senior at Kent, Denver, and she served as a research assistant in Hunt's lab at the Anschutz Medical Campus this summer. She's very interested in Alzheimer's because her grandmother suffers from Alzheimer's disease. She is also an intern at the Alzheimer's Association and the student board member for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. She has been inspired by Dr. Potter, as have lots of us, and she created and implemented the Memory Box Project with middle school students at Grayland to raise awareness in Alzheimer's disease research. Now, she raised more than $3,000. It's incredible. Obviously, that was a great project because the Alzheimer's Association invited her to their international conference in Copenhagen? in Copenhagen this year so she could present that. So that's pretty cool, too. So we have a little presentation for you. And this is signed by Bruce Benson, great guy, <laughs> <laughs> and has University of Colorado at the top and says, in recognition of your inspirational advocacy and philanthropic efforts to raise awareness and funds for Alzheimer's disease, may these experiences pave the way for you to continue to make a difference. Yes. I think she's just the perfect example of what makes America great. Thank you so much to Mrs. Benson for such a kind introduction. <laughs> Approximately 5 million of our friends and family members in the U.S. are currently fighting Alzheimer's disease. And while that's a big number, I think that the individual stories from the people we're losing tell infinitely more. Since 2005, I've watched my grandmother lose her own battle against the disease, and I've watched it take its toll on my grandfather and on the rest of my family. As a child and a teenager, I didn't know how I could help until I met Dr. Huntington Potter. I met Dr. Potter when I was a sophomore in high school. I was worried about my grandmother, and I was eager to help in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Potter was kind enough to allow me to tour his lab, and he suggested that I might try a high school trainee program in a CU Denver lab that summer. This past summer, I had the great honor of serving as a research assistant in Dr. Potter's own Alzheimer's and Down syndrome lab at the Anschutz Medical Campus. My weeks in the lab were transformative in enhancing my ability to understand and implement protocols and to gain an understanding of the experiments we were carrying out. For the first time, I felt like a real scientist and I experienced firsthand how important and exacting research really is. I also know how funding for research is badly needed and I am shocked to find that some of our most talented experts in the field are distracted by the need to raise money for research that benefits us all. I look forward to a day when renowned researchers such as Dr. Potter may spend their valuable time fighting disease rather than raising funds. Though the University of Colorado paid me as a research assistant, I am compelled to donate my earnings back to the CU Foundation for Dr. Potter's research. I hope that this might help in some small way by showing my gratitude for a truly invaluable experience. Perhaps this may serve as an example for others that everyone needs to contribute to the funding for research. It is only through scientific research that we will bring about breakthroughs in the medical field. I would like to thank you, Dr. Potter, for not only dedicating your life to research, but for inspiring and mentoring young people like me. Thank you, Anna. I, I think she may have a career as a fundraiser if nothing else works out. So I can't help adding, I hope all of you will remember what she said about helping contribute to this, whatever that amount might be. That would be wonderful for us. Now on to Dr. Huntington Potter, who I think many of you have heard before. Is there anything wrong? Okay. Um, the way I look at this is we have great faith in Hunt to get this disease cured. My mother died of the disease this year, so I am counting on him to hurry up, get this done before it gets anyone else in my family or yours. I heard somebody describe Hunt this week as the Peyton Manning of Alzheimer's researchers. 
I think that's the best description we could give. So without further ado, please welcome our esteemed researcher, Dr. Huntington Potter. Well, thank you, Marcy, uh, for that kind introduction, and especially Anna for not only uh, coming to the lab and helping us uh, move the research forward, but also being a tireless advocate in her two schools, uh, Grayland and, and Kent Denver. Um, I would like to say that uh, it won't be necessary for Anna to, to cure Alzheimer's disease because we're going to do it before she gets her PhD, but uh, there's never an end to a problem like Alzheimer's disease. There will always have to do more research. So we'll see what happens over the next uh, 10 years. So I also want to thank all of you for coming uh, and spending your lunch hour to learn about what we're doing at, at University of Colorado to cure or at least understand and therefore develop treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to give you an update on what we've been doing over the last two years since I uh, came to the University of Colorado and give you some hope for what we're going to be doing in, in the next number of years. So those of you who have heard me before, I promise that there will be lots of new stuff, uh, even if you've forgotten the original stuff. <laughs> um, and for those who, who haven't heard us, uh, I think our story is, is, is quite compelling. So um, first, as Anna said, uh, Alzheimer's disease is a catastrophe. Uh, it's a tsunami. It's, it's whatever you want to call a uh, problem that is upon us and will really wreck our futures if we don't solve this problem. And that's because, essentially, if everyone in this room if, uh, lives to be 85, uh, half of us will have Alzheimer's disease. And the other half are going to be caregivers. By 2050, the cost of Medicare and Medicaid alone is estimated to be uh, about a trillion dollars a year. And, and we just can't afford it. We absolutely can't afford it, emotionally and financially. So what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is what we're trying to do about that. And, and of course, the implication is that we're all in this together. And of course, that means that we can all help solve the problem together. Scientists love to collaborate with other scientists and with the public, uh, but we need you just as much as we need other scientists. Um, and I'll tell you about how you can help uh, a little bit later. So the main thing that you have to remember about Alzheimer's disease is that it is thanks to medical advances that has become so prominent. Cancer and heart disease do have treatments, do have preventatives. Um, and, and because of that, we're all living much longer uh, than before. Did I see a, a hand in the back saying that I'm not speaking loudly enough? No, it's not coming through. Oh, seats, seats. Please sit down, you know. I, hopefully I won't keep you, uh, you know, from falling asleep or anything like that, but uh, sitting down is much better. Uh, so uh, this slide shows what's going to happen, and now this number by 2050 is about 15 million. Uh, as we realize the disease is worse uh, than we thought. Um, so now about 5 million uh, patients, as uh, Anna said, current 20, 220 billion up to about 1 trillion by 2050. So that's the problem. And what is the solution? Obviously, the solution is more research. Now, there are essentially two major forms of Alzheimer's disease. What most of you have experienced in your families uh, is what we call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. What that means is that we don't know what causes it. It's not 100% genetic, although it's partially genetic. Probably overall Alzheimer's disease is about 70% inherited. But that also means that it's about 30% due to environmental uh, features, and we have a lot more control over that, such as for instance, coming to the CU Advocates meeting where you get cognitive stimulation and walking up the stairs so that you get some, you know, some exercise. Both of those things are very important for slowing uh, the development of, of Alzheimer's disease and, and reducing its risk. 
the other kind of Alzheimer's disease, which has been terribly important for scientists, is what we call purely genetic. And in that situation, a family is carrying a mutation in one of three genes, which I'll tell you about, which guarantees that if you carry that gene, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. And it usually occurs much earlier than the sporadic cases, so that if you have this form, the genetic form, you can get Alzheimer's disease in your 50s, in your 40s, in your 30s, even in your late 20s, depending upon the mutation. Now, obviously, this is a catastrophe for those families, and luckily, it's extremely rare. But the important thing is that by isolating those mutant genes and studying them, scientists have been able to understand the whole pathology of Alzheimer's disease much better than we could if we could only look at the age-related Alzheimer's disease we're all familiar with. But it turns out that if you look in the brains of people with genetic Alzheimer's disease or typical Alzheimer's disease, they basically look the same. And their behavior and their cognitive problems are essentially the same. So they're essentially the same disease. And that's why it's so important to be able to study this form to be able to get insights into this form. The final form is called Down syndrome. And one of the reasons I came to the University of Colorado to start an Alzheimer's center here is because you already had the Linda Cernick Institute for Down syndrome on the Anschutz campus. And I had been working for 20 years on the relationship between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. The take home lesson is that everyone who has Down syndrome develops the pathology in the brain of Alzheimer's disease by the time they're 30 years old. And you can see it beginning in the teenage years. And at least 50% of them get demented by the age of 50 or 60. So this is a very special human population that has challenges anyway, and then they get early onset Alzheimer's disease. But again, as we'll see, studying this special human population gives us insights into typical Alzheimer's disease that are going to be very valuable for developing uh, new treatments. Okay, so what is Alzheimer's disease? Well, you all know what it is because you've met people, know people, heard of people who have Alzheimer's disease. But from a pathologist's point of view, of course, you have to look at the brain. And this is essentially what a brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease looks like compared to a typical brain over here. You can see that the tissue has shrunken. The spaces, the sulci in between the folds of tissue have gotten bigger. So the total brain mass has gone down. And the reason is because this brain has fewer neurons and fewer neuronal processes and connections between neurons. So they're not only fewer neurons, but the neurons that are there don't talk to each other that well. And that leads to the cognitive problems that we all recognize in the clinic as Alzheimer's disease. If this was all we had, we wouldn't have very much. But the key discovery was Alzheimer, in 1907, used a very special new stain that allowed him to recognize these deposits called amyloid deposits or amyloid plaques, and these abnormal neurons, which have neurofibrillary tangles in them. Now, what this means in lay language is that certain proteins that are perfectly normal proteins have changed in a way that they aggregate together and make these Grillo pads called neuritic plaques or amyloid plaques and deposit inside neurons, such as this one, and kill them. That alone said that Alzheimer's disease was different than anything that had been seen before. And although Alzheimer didn't name it after himself, that was the head of his institute that wanted to raise funds, um, then uh, we now call it Alzheimer's disease. And that's essentially what, what it was for, for 70, 80 years. It wasn't until 1984 that the modern molecular approach to Alzheimer's disease was made possible by Glenner and Wong, who discovered the major component of this amyloid deposit. And that major component we now call the A-beta peptide. It's shown here in, in abbreviated form. Each one of these letters is a different amino acid that makes this peptide. And at the end, there'll be a test of what these, you know, <laughs> no, I don't even know them, quite frankly. But uh, this beta peptide is the key to Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to tell you why in the next few slides. 
The first hint that it was important was the finding of a mutation in this family from Sweden. The mutation that gives this family inherited Alzheimer's disease is in the gene that makes that beta peptide. That's what's mutant. And every person in this family who inherits that mutant gene gets Alzheimer's disease. Since you have two copies of the gene, 50% of the children in every generation get Alzheimer's disease. So that meant that this peptide and its gene were key to this disease in this family. Now, the other thing that was discovered at this time was that this gene, the amyloid precursor protein gene, is on chromosome 21. And now things began to make a little sense because people with Down syndrome, of course, have three copies of chromosome 21 instead of only two like everybody else has. And that means they have three copies of the APP gene and they make more a beta peptide. That's why it deposits early. That's why they get Alzheimer's disease early. So that all made good sense, and it started us on the road to understanding how to try to reverse this problem. Now the first step you're going to have to, to do in order to, to study Alzheimer's disease is to develop an animal model. Now the only animals that I know of that naturally get anything like Alzheimer's disease are monkeys, who are not only expensive but potentially ethically uh, you know, challenged in terms of using many, many of them to study Alzheimer's disease, and polar bears, which I really don't think we want large numbers of polar bears in the lab. <laughs> Mice and rats, which are our normal experimental animal in the lab, don't get Alzheimer's disease. But we could take this gene that's mutant in this family and put it into a mouse, and then that mouse gets Alzheimer's disease, and the mouse's children get Alzheimer's disease, and now we have a way to study uh, this disorder and develop new treatments. So how do you tell whether a mouse has Alzheimer's disease? Well, of course, they get plaques in, uh, in the brain, and that's good, but they also have confusion in water mazes such as this one. This is what we call the radial arm water maze, and it, it's very simple. In this one, it's just a kid's swimming pool filled with water. And uh, there are eight arms that the, uh, the, the mice can work on. This is actually six arms. And uh, you put the mouse in one of these arms, and they swim around, and they try to find this little glass platform which sits right underneath the water so they can't see it, but they can get out of the water if they find the platform. Now, of course, they don't know where the platform is to begin with, so you put them on the platform, let them look around, say, oh, yeah, I see where we are. And then you put them in one of the, uh, the arms, and they swim very quickly to the platform and, and get out of the water if they're a normal mouse. Now, for those of you who are very worried about the way we treat our mice, I promise you that we take very good care of them. They never are in the water for more than a minute without getting dried off and, uh, and, and put under the sun lamp. And uh, they're extremely valuable to us because this mouse costs more to live in our mouse hotel for a year on a gram for gram basis that it does, th uh, the university pays my uh, salary or even Bruce's salary. <laughs> so they're incredibly important uh, uh, partners in our, in our research. And uh, we take very good care of them. And what they uh, tell us is that if they have that mutant gene, they can't find this platform for anything. And that tells us that if we could treat them with something, we might be able to find out whether they can now find the platform, and that would be a treatment for, for Alzheimer's disease. So what do we know about the pathogenic pathway uh, to Alzheimer's disease? Well, I mentioned the amyloid precursor protein, uh, which is encoded on chromosome 21. The A-beta peptide, which Glenner and Wong discovered, is part of this peptide, uh, of this protein. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease is this little red area gets clipped out and becomes just a free-floating little peptide. That happens in about 5% of the time. Another 95% of the time, the cleavage occurs here, and that's totally harmless. That's totally normal, no problems at all. But when this happens, this beta peptide is what's toxic to neurons. And the way it gets toxic is because it has a natural tendency to stick to itself and make little fibers that aggregate into those Brillo pads, which we call amyloid deposits, in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, the fact that we know that the A-beta peptide is dangerous and can make fibers 
gives us an idea, as you can see right there, how we could try to prevent this disease. We could inhibit this enzyme so it doesn't make this cleavage. Or we could activate this enzyme so it works better. Or we could inhibit this enzyme. Or we could prevent the A-beta from forming filaments. All of those things have been developed in the laboratory and they're currently in clinical trials. I'd like to say that they have been successful, but unfortunately they've not. And the big debate in the field right now is, are we barking up the wrong tree? Or are the drugs just insufficient? Or maybe, and this is the current view, we need to start earlier. If somebody has the clinical problems of Alzheimer's disease, you know, it may be too late. The first 10 dominoes have already fallen, and even if you could keep any uh, more from falling uh, at the beginning of that stage, that's too late. You need to start earlier. And so what's happening is some of these drugs are now being started in people who have not yet gotten Alzheimer's disease, but we know they're going to because they have a mutation. And we'll see what happens with that. Now, I mentioned that people with Down syndrome all get Alzheimer's disease. And some of you have heard me talk before, know that we've been studying a special group of people who almost never get Alzheimer's disease. And that's people with rheumatoid arthritis. So, you know, it's not great to have rheumatoid arthritis, but it does seem to protect people from developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, the people who discovered that a number of years ago assumed that the reason why people with rheumatoid arthritis don't get Alzheimer's disease is because they take a lot of drugs for their pain and their inflammation. And we knew from our work, and other people confirmed this, that Alzheimer's disease involves inflammation. If you don't have inflammation in the brain, you probably wouldn't develop Alzheimer's disease no matter how much A-beta peptide you had. So big clinical trials were started with various kinds of anti-inflammatory drugs, and they totally failed to make people with Alzheimer's disease better or slow the course of the disease. So then they said, well, why don't we start earlier? We'll start with mild cognitively impaired people, and they started a big clinical trial with those people, and they had to stop it early because they got worse faster instead of less fast. So that's a bummer. It's a good idea, made logical sense, seemed to be supported by some mouse work, but it didn't work in people. So we took a slightly different view, and that was maybe there's something secreted during rheumatoid arthritis into the blood that is moving around the body and finally gets into the brain and protects them from Alzheimer's disease. So I asked my student, Tim Boyd, to go into the library and make me a big list of everything that got secreted into the blood of people with, with rheumatoid arthritis. And we began to narrow the list down by logic and experiment and finally came to one protein that we're focusing on right now. That protein is called granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. That's another test. But we call it GMCSF. And what it does is it stimulates the bone marrow to make more white blood cells of various kinds. And those can get into the brain, and some of them have been trained to be little Pac-Men that go around and eat up anything that shouldn't be there amyloid deposits. And so our first experiment was to inject GMCSF into the side of a brain of a living mouse that has Alzheimer's disease and has plaques, and then ordinary salt water into the other side. One injection, one week later, half of the amyloid was gone. So that was a very successful experiment. I wouldn't say unexpected, because we wouldn't have done it if we didn't want to know the answer, but we certainly didn't expect quite that uh, uh, amount of, of success. So then what we did was to uh, inject the uh, GMCSF under the skin, because we knew that it affected the bone marrow and could actually also get into the brain, and, and that allowed us to use that water maze to show that not only did the mice get rid of their amyloid, but they returned to total normal cognition in a couple of weeks of treatment. So that was the confirmation that this was going to help the cognition of the mice. And the lucky thing about it is that this molecule, GMCSF, was already an FDA-approved drug for bone marrow transplant patients. 
never been tried in Alzheimer's patients, but it could be because it was perfectly safe, already been shown to be safe for 20 years. So that meant that we had to try to get a clinical trial started. Now, one of the ways that you start a clinical trial is that you already have some Alzheimer's patients that have come into a memory and dementia clinic and are waiting to contribute their uh, you know, uh, contribution to, to Alzheimer's disease research. Um, and the NIH, in its wisdom, has essentially started a cohort of Alzheimer's centers around the country. And uh, here they are. See what's wrong with this slide? Uh, yeah, right. They're all on the East Coast, a little bit in the middle, and on the West Coast, and there's essentially nothing between the Mississippi and the West Coast. So we had to begin to put together an Alzheimer's center where we could study GMCSF in, in the clinic. And we started to do that. Our progress in the last two years has been astronomical, if I must say so myself. But it isn't only me. It's also a group of people who have come together at the University of Colorado to put together an Alzheimer's center. So first step, of course, is to open a memory and dementia clinic. And so Jonathan Woodcock was hired. Uh, Chris Billy had been working sort of part-time on this for a long time. But he's the VA uh, doc, couldn't work full-time. Uh, Jonathan is now working full time, and the number of Alzheimer's patients that have been seen by the new memory and dementia clinic has risen from about 100 a year to 1,200 a year in a couple of years. So that's great. That means we're getting the word out, people are coming in, they're getting assessed, getting treated. That's very good. We also applied to the, uh, uh, the, the board of regents and the uh, president for permission to officially open an Alzheimer's disease research center here at the University of Colorado. And so that's called the University of Colorado Alzheimer's Disease Research and Clinical Center. That was approved in, uh, I think, December of 2013. The Memory and Dementia Clinic is part of that center. So we're on the way, and, and that means that we can also start that clinical trial. And you'll be happy to know that I've been talking about it for about a year now, and we just injected our first patient at, at the University of Colorado Denver Anschutz Medical Campus this week, and uh, we injected our first patient in Tampa, where we have a second site last week. So we're on our way. So far, no ill effects. That's good. And uh, we hope to get that initial sort of preliminary study done in, in the next three or four months. Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good question. I'll repeat any. Yeah, I should say that, you know, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go along. Um, you know, if you have a question, it's very likely somebody next to you has the same question too embarrassed to ask. So go ahead and ask questions, fine. So the question is, how far along are people uh, who are being treated now in this study? They're what we call mild to moderate. And the reason for that is that if they're too far gone, then we can't tell whether the drug might be making them worse like the, the anti-inflammatory drugs did. You know, so we need to know that. And if they're too early, you know, we may not be able to, to help them. So we take them sort of in the middle. And, and we'll be treated for about three weeks. It's mostly a safety trial to see whether they can tolerate this. But of course, we'll be testing their cognition as well. And if it looks good uh, in safety, then we will start a six-month trial. And we're raising money for that. It's going to cost about $4 million. That's just the way clinical trials are. Yes, ma'am. We don't know yet in humans, because that's the purpose of the trial. But in mice, it completely reverses the symptoms. OK, so the second uh, thing we did, yes, ma'am, sir. It, it'll come back to you, I promise. Yes, sir. Uh, they get it under the skin. So it's a, it's a molecule that goes into the circulation, it gets to the bone marrow and stimulates the production of new white cells, and it also can get into the brain. Okay? So uh, I mentioned that we had started an Alzheimer's disease research and clinical center at the University of Colorado, and that's great. Um, but all of the rest of the centers that I put on that uh, map have been approved by the National Institute on Aging in Washington. And we would like to have our center approved that way also. Uh, it comes with a big grant, which is good. 
Uh, but the problem is that uh, if we get one, uh, one of those other centers will have to go away because there isn't enough Washington money to uh, fund everybody. Uh, but we're very hopeful that we'll be able to get approved by uh, the NIH for this grant. It went in as the Rocky Mountain Alzheimer's Disease Research Center on uh, you know, uh, May 14th of this year. It's being reviewed today and yesterday at the NIH. So we're looking on the online uh, report to see what the, re you know, the review was. Uh, quite frankly, we uh, have to be realistic. Almost never are, is a center like this approved the first time you apply. We may have to apply again. When I set up the center in Florida, it was approved the first time around. But you know, we're going to have to be realistic about this. Now, I think that we have a very good chance because our Rocky Martin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center has a very special feature that the other centers don't have, and that is the ability to study people with Down syndrome in a focused way. So because we have the Linda Cernick Institute for Down syndrome, the Adult Down Syndrome Clinic, we'll be able to get these people into the clinic and study them in a very focused way, and the other centers aren't doing that. So that's our special uh, you know, aspect of this center. And the other thing is, is that Native Americans happen to, by one or two reports, have a tendency to have less Alzheimer's disease than the uh, Caucasian population. We ought to find out why. There are plenty of Native Americans uh, in the area, and uh, you know, we have one of the best Native American clinical centers right here on the Anschutz campus of the University of Colorado. And so there's no reason not to utilize the resources. And in fact, I've been incredibly impressed coming to the University of Colorado, being here only two years, how many pieces of an Alzheimer's center were actually already here. They just hadn't been put together into one page and, and one center. And, and that was uh, very gratifying because it reduces the amount of work we had to do in terms of new recruitments and getting people trained and everything like that. So we're up and running uh, thanks to the work of people like Jonathan. Now, I mentioned that people with, uh, with uh, Down syndrome all develop Alzheimer's disease, so I want to go into a little more depth about what that has meant to our, our research. Uh, this person is a typical person with Alzheimer's disease. This is a typical person with Down syndrome. She will develop the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease by the age of 30 and eventually develop dementia. So we already knew that. But what we came up with was another idea, which turned out to be very interesting. And that is that maybe trisomy 21 or three copies of chromosome 21 causes Alzheimer's disease in this person. And what if it also helped make this person get Alzheimer's disease? Now, all of us are born with two copies of every chromosome. But every time our cells divide, they have the potential to make mistakes. And so maybe. The idea was this person has been unlucky enough to make mistakes often enough during their life that they accumulate cells with the wrong numbers of chromosomes. Now, we already know that three copies of chromosome 21 is relatively harmless. I mean, people with Down syndrome live perfectly happy lives. It can live to be 60 years old now. So it can't be too damaging to have three copies of chromosome 21. So maybe they accumulate in people like this. And so uh, we asked. How many chromosome 21s do people with Alzheimer's disease have compared to people without Alzheimer's disease? And the way you do that is you make a, a karyotype spread like this, and you stain the chromosome purple, and you start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You can see that they're all different shapes and sizes, and this one is probably chromosome 21. So we just count how many there are. The other thing you can do, which is a lot easier, is shown over here where there's a little probe that is fluorescent in the microscope, lights up number chromosome 21, and you get two spots if it's from a typical person, and three spots if it's from somebody with, with uh, Down syndrome. And uh, we just then looked at people with, with Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that the skin cells of people with Alzheimer's disease at all kinds, both the familial kind, APP mutations, et cetera, have cells with three copies of chromosome 21 compared to people without Alzheimer's disease. And around the world, people began to look, and they found that this was true in every tissue they looked at, including, and this is work from Europe, the brain. And you can see that brain cells 
in a person with Alzheimer's disease are about 10% trisomy 21. So a person with, with Alzheimer's disease is really a mosaic Down syndrome. It's just they weren't born that way. They developed it over time. And that tells us something about what's going wrong. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's a very interesting question about whether uh, people with uh, Down syndrome get rheumatoid arthritis. And I haven't been able to get a straight answer about that, but they apparently do. And part of the reason is that they're prone to autoimmune diseases, and rheumatoid arthritis is partially an autoimmune disease. I completely agree, and we will start looking for exactly those people. Thank you. Right. So now... Uh, you have a discovery. The question is, why is it happening? Why is that person with Alzheimer's disease developing cells that have three copies of chromosome 21? Well, of course, in order to understand that, you have to understand mitosis. So this is the hardest slide of, of the evening or afternoon. Uh, this is typical mitosis. Here's a cell. The chromosomes are all in the nucleus and sort of floating around. And when the cell wants to divide, the first thing it does is duplicate all the chromosomes. So instead of having two copies of each chromosome, you've got four copies, and you want to eventually give them to the two daughter cells. That's called female chauvinism. They're called daughter cells. I don't know why. So these daughter cells have to get an equal number of each of the chromosomes. And so the way they uh, do that is that the cell starts lining all the chromosomes up in the middle, and it has these little fibers in green that are intended to move these chromosomes to the two sides of this cell and eventually form a dumbbell cell and eventually two cells. So it's very important that these chromosomes line up properly and that there are little motors that actually move them to each side of the cell. So there's a little sort of mechanism going on. That's called mitosis. And uh, so we asked, what happens when you add a beta peptide to a cell that's divided? And there's a special way to do that so that you can take pictures. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit dark, but this is a mitosis that is normal. It's not being treated with, with uh, uh, A beta. You can see the DNA is blue, and those fibers we call microtubules, which are going to pull the DNA apart into the two sides of the cell, they're in red. And, and this is a, uh, a mitotic spindle that has been treated with A beta. And uh, so we have a little movie here, which will tell you what happens. You can see that the DNA is beginning to spread. Um, but here, the DNA is being squirted out to the side and is all in the wrong places. So let's look at a different slide like that. Same thing. This is a perfectly normal spindle to begin with. And now you treat it with A beta, and the DNA goes in all directions. This is a terrible thing to do because it means that the DNA is not going to get segregated to the daughter cells correctly, and they're all going to get the wrong number of chromosomes. So we now know the mechanism by which Alzheimer's patients develop the wrong number of chromosomes in some of their cells, and we're trying to develop new treatments based on that. We've got a hint, but it's only a hint at the moment. So that's how basic science starts with an idea, tries to test the idea, then goes into the mice, and then goes into the rats, and eventually we get a drug. Now, I mentioned that Alzheimer's disease is only about 70% inherited, and that 30% of it is due to environment in one way or another, and that exercise and cognitive stimulation is uh, important uh, parts of the environment that you can manipulate. The more exercise you get, the more cognitive stimulation, the less likely you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease early. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing that we discovered was that caffeine is an interesting molecule that we all take lots of, or some people do. And uh, it turns out that people with Alzheimer's disease tend to drink much less coffee and take more uh, of other things than people without Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, if, if you ask retrospectively, you find out that if people in middle age were drinking three to five cups of coffee a day, they're about a 60% reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. 
Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah. But, but, it, it, <laughs> it could be that the people who drink three to five cups of coffee a day are the ones who are CEOs and, uh, and high-priced uh, and high-tensioned uh, lawyers and doctors, and, and they need three to five cups of coffee a day, but what's protecting them from Alzheimer's disease is the fact that they are cognitively stimulated uh, all the time. Um, so we had to do an experiment to find out what would happen if we added caffeine to the mice uh, that we have that have Alzheimer's disease. So we did several experiments, and, and here's, uh, here's one of them. If you measure the amount of A-beta peptide in the cells that have been treated, I mean, in the mice that have been treated with, uh, with uh, caffeine, there's much less A-beta peptide than the mice that have been treated. So that's an active thing. They're not cognitively stimulated. They're not CEOs. They've just taken uh, caffeine. <laughs> and if you do it in cells and culture, it depends upon how much caffeine you add, but the amount of A-beta can go down and down and down with more caffeine added to the cells. And the mice that are treated with caffeine have no trouble finding their way around that maze. So that's also very good. Now, mice aren't people. Uh, you know, they, they are wonderful critters, but they don't have exactly the same kind of Alzheimer's disease as people have, so they're easier to fix. Um, but there is an interesting hint that we just discovered and, and published last year, which is that uh, if you measure the caffeine levels in the blood of people who come into the clinic, they are divided into people who are normal, people who have mild cognitive impairment, and people who have Alzheimer's disease. And what we found was that people who are normal have about 1,500 nanograms per mil of caffeine, maybe almost 2,000. People with Alzheimer's disease have less than half of that. But the most interesting thing is that if you bring the people in on day zero and then you assay them three years later for their cognitive abilities, you find that the caffeine level predicts who's going to decline to Alzheimer's disease. So if you have mild cognitive impairment or are normal and you have a, this amount of caffeine in your blood, then you're going to stay that way. Even if you have mild cognitive impairment, if you've got enough caffeine in your blood, you're going to stay that way. You don't decline. But if you have this much caffeine in your blood instead, you go to Alzheimer's disease in three years. So again, we have to be careful. Maybe these people have lost their taste buds and their olfactory neurons, and they can't detect the caffeine, I mean, the, the coffee as much. They don't like it as much, and so they don't drink as much. But for one reason or another, these people have less caffeine. So we're going to start a clinical trial. It's being planned now to try to introduce caffeine into people who normally don't drink it, see if they can be protected from developing uh, dementia from myocognitive impairment. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we, they don't have to drink coffee. We will give them a pill or a patch. There are, there are caffeine patches. You could imagine how those could be misused. But, yes. Um, there is a lot, but of course they are also uh, a special genetic group and they have many other common environmental uh, experiences that are different than everybody else. Uh, so it's not really possible to tell because they also don't drink and they get lots of exercise. So, you know, it's a little hard to compare them. But there are major studies being used to, to study them. Yeah. Okay, so that's our next clinical trial. And uh, the final slide is that I want to leave you with the conviction that the University of Colorado is the place we're going to be able to cure this disease. We want to try to change this red line into this green line. And uh, we can do it if we have enough resources and enough support. And I must say that we've gotten a lot of support from the community. Not only have Bruce and Marcy Benson been very generous, but the legislature actually gave us $250,000 this year. And, and, and that was voted on by everybody. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent or an agnostic, you can still realize that Alzheimer's disease is important. And um, the, the governor, Hickenlooper, has also written a letter to the NIH in support of our, uh, of our center uh, saying that he would put money, $500,000 a year for the next five years into his priority budget. And that's big. So we have a wonderful community and, and all of you can be proud of the fact that there are CU advocates. If you drive by Anschutz Medical Campus or you fly over it uh, coming into DIA, you can look down and say, that's where we, not they, but that's where we are trying to get the cure for Alzheimer's disease. Because we can't do it without you. We need patients, we need supporters, we need political help, and uh, we're all in this together so uh, we can solve it together. And thank you very much. Okay, so I think we have time for more questions if you have any. Yes, in the back there? Okay, the question is, what's the relationship between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease? They really are two different ways to attack the brain, and the mechanisms are quite different. But most people with Parkinson's disease in their later stages do have some Alzheimer's disease as well. And so it's actually tricky to develop a clinical trial that is pure Alzheimer's and pure uh, uh, Parkinson's disease to try to compare them. So it's a good question, but as far as we know, for instance, the A-beta peptide has no contributory, uh, 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 you know, uh, and no contribution to, to Parkinson's disease. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease? So dementia is a clinical syndrome, which is the big umbrella. That is where uh, the person is confused with respect to where they are, what time of day it is, what you know, uh, you know even what uh, uh, week it is, or what season it is, and they have very serious short-term memory problems. Uh, so they would be considered demented if they are having those kinds of features sufficient that it interferes with their daily life. Mild cognitive impairment is a lesser version of that. Their daily life is not particularly affected, but when you get them into the laboratory and you ask them questions in the right kind of way, you can see that they have memory problems. Okay, so those are clinical descriptors. Alzheimer's disease is the mechanism by which you can get mild cognitive impairment or dementia. In the elderly, about 70% of mild cognitive impairment or dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease but it could be caused by other mechanisms, such as Parkinson's disease, such as mad cow disease, you know, such as uh, wernicke kosakoff syndrome from being an alcoholic for decades. Uh, but as I say, mostly in the elderly, it's, it's Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, what about vascular dementia? Vascular dementia causes many of the same symptoms as Alzheimer's disease. A good neurologist, and I'm just a PhD lab, you know, rat kind of guy, uh, then uh, you can tell the difference between, you know, vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And what happens in vascular dementia is that you essentially get atherosclerosis in the vessels of the brain. You get uh, leakage of the blood into the brain, so you can get little strokes, and those kill nerve cells, and you eventually get the same kind of of uh, cell death uh, uh, dementia. Um, it is highly related to Alzheimer's disease, just as Parkinson's is, in the sense that very few people with Alzheimer's disease don't have any vascular dementia. And very few people with mostly vascular dementia have no plaques and tangles. So uh, again, in clinical trials, it's important to distinguish between them. But we've found something very interesting, which I didn't have time to talk about today, and that is that cholesterol has the same kind of effect on cells that A-beta does. It causes them to missegregate their chromosomes. And what that means is that the atherosclerotic plaques, which have aneuploid cells in them, might have been generated by the excess A-beta in the person with Alzheimer's disease. So that means that the vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease connection may be not just 
bad luck as you get old, but there may be a mechanistic relationship, and, and we're looking into that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. There's an article in the New York Times this week about how scientists were just able to create what they called Alzheimer's in a Petri dish. Um, and so they're reproducing brain cells. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the question is, is this a great breakthrough? And the answer is yes. In fact, one of my former students is the lead author on that, nice. Rudy Tanzi. Nice. Um, and uh, what they've been able to do is to take cells that have been induced to be neurons, even though they originally came from skin cells from an Alzheimer's patient, and put them together with microglia and astrocytes and, and show that with the right stimulation, those cultures develop the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease right in the Petri dish. And then they could go and add drugs to them that should prevent the formation of A-beta or help pro uh, you know, promote cell uh, you know, survival. And they do help. So, you so have it's to better than a mouse because it's right. cheaper and it's easier. And it's real human cells, so that's good. Uh, the only thing that's a tiny bit worrisome is that the drugs that they tried are the drugs that were developed in the mice and haven't worked in humans. But they help the, the, the cultures. So there's some disconnect there. We have to find out why. But yes, it's a breakthrough, no question. Yes, ma'am. How does one know if it's really wrong or not? There's clinical studies. OK, so the question is, how can you either volunteer or volunteer a friend of yours to participate in clinical studies? Um, the Rocky Mountain Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, for instance, is a clinical study in the sense that we're going to follow people of all types over the course of five years to see who converts and who doesn't. So we need people who are normal, people who have mild cognitive impairment, people who are at the very earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease. For the clinical trials of a drug such as leukine or GMCSF or caffeine, we will need people who are in the mild to moderate stages of the disease. And then they would have to be screened, you know, if they have, you know, too much heart disease, we probably wouldn't take them. If they've got other problems like MS, we probably wouldn't take them. So we would have to, to assess them. But you can volunteer to be on the list, so to speak, uh, by calling the Memory and Dementia Clinic, or, you know, go on the web and, and, and volunteer. And we need volunteers, so that's, that's very good. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, uh, formally, uh, Alzheimer's disease was said to be undiagnosable until autopsy and death. And when you heard that, that was correct at that time. But thanks to the fact that our cognitive assessment tools have gotten better and that we have the imaging uh, capability, MRI and PET imaging, MRI can tell whether the brain is shrunk. PET imaging can actually see the plaques and soon be able to see the tangles in real time in a living individual, then we can be much, much surer. And a, and a good clinical center uh, can take somebody with mild cognitive impairment and predict whether they have Alzheimer's disease about 90 or 95 percent of the time. And that was not true before. A person out in the community who's a dedicated uh, you know, a family doc or even a neurologist but without special training for Alzheimer's disease, they might be you know, right 60% of the time. It depends upon who you see. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, you. Um, now, can we go to market? Sure, <laughs> sure. I don't want to, 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 to say that I'm, I'm you know, uh, promoting a particular brand, but when I was in school, before they had all these other fancy things, we took no dose. Um, now, the thing is that I don't recommend you go rushing off and, and taking a lot of no dose because <laughs> Um, it, it does have gastrointestinal side effects, um, and some people who have heart problems can have uh, increased heart problems, but a normal person normally doesn't have that reaction. So let us do the experiment first to see if it really <laughs> helps, and uh, then we'll, we'll get back to you. Yes, ma'am. So it's recently been proposed that the lymphatic system, its malfunction may lead to Alzheimer's pathology. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've researched that and what your opinion is. Okay, so the question is, what about the lymphatic system? Is it defective in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, and there are two aspects of that question. One is the, the lymphatic system that is involved in the immune 
system, and the other is the drainage of the CSF from the brain. And um, there was a big study about 15 years ago that tried to essentially uh, drain the brain faster or better in people with Alzheimer's disease, and it didn't work. So at least that simple idea is probably not right. But it's a complex interaction between the fluid of the brain and the tissue of the brain. And uh, one of the things that is curious about people with Alzheimer's disease is that when you take a CSF uh, you know, tap from their spine, the amount of A-beta peptide rises in the very earliest parts of the disease and then drops. And the reason it drops is because it's all stuck in the brain. It can't get out. Okay, so one of the questions is, could we help it get out a little bit better? Um, now, the immune system has also been proposed as a, as a way to attack Alzheimer's disease. And IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, is a treatment for autoimmune diseases that works for them. It's been tried in people with Alzheimer's disease. It was a total failure. So great ideas, very logical, just so far hasn't worked. Thanks. Uh, Cindy Cohagen is here, and she represents the CU Foundation. And so all you have to do is talk to her and designate it for Alzheimer's research. But can I also add that there are envelopes on every table if oh, you would like to write a well, check. And we will be at the front table outside the door to collect them if you wish to donate to his research. Right. And tell your rich you know, Uncle Harry, too. <laughs> yes, sir. So the question is, if you take uh, blood from a young mouse and transfuse it into an old mouse, can you reduce some of the effects of Alzheimer's disease? We have done that experiment, um, but not with young and old, but with a mouse that was genetically predetermined to get Alzheimer's disease and a mouse that wasn't. And yes, it, it increases the speed with which the second mouse gets Alzheimer's disease, and the first mouse gets a little bit better. Um, we don't know whether this is realistically going to be an effective treatment, but some people are beginning to look at young blood to ask what are the molecules that are important about converting an old mouse to a new younger mouse. And the best results that I know about so far have been on the heart. The heart is improved by doing that kind of uh, fusion. The way they do it is what we call uh, a, a parabiosed mouse. So you take two mice, and you basically suture them together with, with uh, you know, sutures. So surgically, you connect them together like Siamese twins. They live the rest of their life that way. They're perfectly happy. Um, but if one of them is young, one of them is old, or one of them is a genetic mutation, one of them isn't, the blood is shared between them, and you can learn a lot that way. Yeah. But we don't yet know. Yes, sir. So the question is, if you have a family history of Alzheimer's disease, what do we recommend? And the answer is it depends upon how uh, the, the family history presents. If the people are getting Alzheimer's disease in their 50s or 40s or younger, then it could be one of these mutations, in which case a, 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 a genetic test will tell somebody who's younger whether they have the mutation or not. And they may wish to know that, and they may not wish to know that. The more that we look at the genetics of Alzheimer's disease, the more confusing it gets. But there is one thing to take home, and that is that there are three forms of the ApoE gene, ApoE2, 3, and 4. I don't know what happened to ApoE1, but anyway, there are 2, 3, and 4. And uh, if you inherit an ApoE4 uh, form of, the, of that gene, you remember from the slide that I showed you about the pathogenic pathway, what ApoE does is it's a catalyst that converts A-beta peptide into those fibers. And without that catalyst, the A-beta peptide would be totally harmless. So this ApoE4 uh, protein confers about a three-fold increased risk if you inherit one copy. If you inherit two copies, it's about a 10 or 12-fold increased risk. And that affects maybe 10% of the population or less. Um, so you could be tested for ApoE, and people ask whether they should be or not. And I tell them, I don't know my ApoE status. I've been offered it. People have done it for free for other people in the lab. I say, no. 
And the reason be is because I want to be able to stand up in front of you and say, I don't know my ApoE4 status, and I don't recommend you get it either. Why? Because it's not going to change your life. It's not going to change your, your approach, really, because there's no treatment for Alzheimer's disease yet. So it's helpful for a clinician to be able to be sure that you have Alzheimer's disease and not something else, but if you don't have symptoms, it's not worth it. Now, there was a very interesting study in which they took people who were at risk for Alzheimer's disease because they had family members. They divided them into two. They did the genetic test for APOE on all of them, but they only told half of them what the results were. And then they followed them over the next uh, you know, uh, six months or a year. And in contrast to what the researchers were worried about, which is the people who knew their APOE status would get depressed, go off with a new girlfriend, run around the world, quit their job, no, no. Nothing like that happened. They only started paying closer attention to their health. They went out and joined an exercise club, they cut down their cholesterol, they cut down on their, uh, their uh, smoking and everything else. So they actually benefited from knowing because they were at higher risk and they did all these wonderful environmental things to make them better. So that sort of changed my mind a little bit about whether it's worthwhile knowing. But uh, you could, of course, go do all those wonderful things anyway, just on the off chance, right? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us about the investigation of what motivates Yes. Uh, there are two places that you could look. Depends upon how detailed you want. Um, Allsforum.org, A L Z F O R U M, is a website for scientists. And you can get all the latest papers out there, and there will be discussions and interviews with people. It's really a great site. And then, of course, the Alzheimer's Association, with which we work very closely, has a wonderful website, uh, not only about information about Alzheimer's disease, but they have a trialmatch.org, uh, you know, part of the website that allows people to sign up and be, uh, know what clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease are being uh, carried out in their area. So if you have somebody in Chicago, just go on the website and they can find out what's going on there. And uh, they also uh, have information about what support services that the Alzheimer's Association uh, you know, provides to help families deal with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Because it's, you know, it, it may be very hard for the Alzheimer's person at the beginning, but then after a while, they don't mind so much, but the family has really uh, got a problem. So uh, it's a, uh, a site that can, can, can help you with that, and uh, I, I recommend it uh, very highly. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when I say never, it means that they're about eight or tenfold protected, which for all practical purposes is never. I don't know of any case reported of a person who had the genetic form of Alzheimer's disease and had rheumatoid arthritis to see how protective it might be under those circumstances. I just don't know. But I can tell you that the mice are the genetic form of Alzheimer's disease because they have the genetic mutation from people and they get better by, by leukine. So it might be hopeful, but there are no data yet. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is demographically, uh, is the disease uh, a uh, special disease that affects certain groups either because of their genetics or their environment? and uh, protects other groups, or is it an equal opportunity killer? And the, uh, the best way to you know, take home this is that it's an equal opportunity killer. Um, there are increased risk for people who have uh, cardiovascular problems already. There's an increased risk for women, and there are lots of reasons why that can happen. There may be a slightly decreased risk in India because they eat a lot of Indian food needless to say, and Indian food has a lot of spices in it that we don't use so much here, and some of them are antioxidants, at least that's the theory. But it also is very difficult to find out exactly how many people have Alzheimer's disease in a particular community. And I can give you an example of that. It used to be said that maybe 20% of people over the age of 80 had Alzheimer's disease. And then a very clever guy went into the south end of Boston and they walked up the four flights of stairs and all those wooden triple-deckers and quadruple-deckers and interviewed everybody he could find in a you know, certain part of Boston. 
and he found that there were a lot of people living at home that actually had Alzheimer's disease. They were protected by their families. They'd never seen a physician, and that's why we now know that 40 or 50 percent of people over 80 or 85 have Alzheimer's disease. So that would need to be done in a place like India to find out for sure. Yeah, good, good question. Yes, ma'am. So what's the final event that kills a person with Alzheimer's disease? It can vary from person to person, but it's usually something like aspiration pneumonia, where they can't swallow properly anymore, so they breathe in their food particles, they're contaminated, and they start a pneumonia in the lung, and they can't be controlled. And, and that's why knowing for sure how many people die of Alzheimer's disease every year is tricky, because very often you read the death certificate and says died of pneumonia. It doesn't necessarily die of complications from Alzheimer's disease. That's changing, um, but it, it makes it a little bit tricky. But that's usually the kind of problem it is. Yeah. And they're very often healthy in many other ways. One of the things I didn't get into today is that people with Down syndrome almost never get solid tumors, almost never. And people with Alzheimer's disease are much reduced in risk for solid tumors. We think we know why, and we're going to look into that, but that's a sort of side benefit of being part of a university because I can just walk across the street to the cancer center and set up a collaboration to test this idea, and that's what we're doing. It, yes. Just in terms of fundraising, I know the Alzheimer's Association raised a million dollars a couple weeks ago. Is there a percentage that goes directly to your center, or what's the relationship? Okay, very good question. Uh, the answer is zero. The Alzheimer's Association is a national international uh, uh, group, and when you, uh, you know, support the Alzheimer's Association, you support local uh, outreach efforts, education, and that kind of thing within the local area. But all research dollars for the Alzheimer's Association go to Chicago, and they go into a grant program which people apply for from all over the country. I'm not against that system, but one of the problems about a peer-reviewed a grant program is that really novel things tend not to get funded because they can only support about 10% of the applications and naturally they're going to tend to support the scientists themselves are going to decide to support the ones that are much more sure to give a positive result in a couple of years. And uh, so that's the weakness. It also means that you can't support your favorite university, University of Colorado, <laughs> because it's going to go to Chicago. So it's whatever you want to do. Um, I know what I do. <laughs> yes? Will implementing the positive health, health or lifestyle changes help people with, who already have some form of Alzheimer's? Good question. The question is, is can improving your lifestyle help somebody who already has Alzheimer's disease? The data are not quite as clear for that. Um, but if you reduce your cholesterol and your blood pressure, um, you're much reduced uh, risk for developing small strokes in the brain, probably help a lot with the underlying Alzheimer's disease as well. So I, I think the take home lesson is that if you can handle it, improving your lifestyle at all ages is a good idea. Yes, sir. Right, it is true. Uh, the question is, is the fact that we're seeing Alzheimer's disease rise so spectacularly due only to the aging population? And the answer is yes, with the only slight caveat that it's become recognized so much more now that people diagnose it correctly more often instead of just saying, oh, it's just old timers disease and not something to worry about. Yes. So the question is, is it difficult to get people with mild cognitive impairment to come into the clinic and, and participate in clinical trials? And the, the answer is the yes and no. Uh, we're certainly not seeing as many as are out there, but the ones that volunteer are sufficient for our needs right now. But the denial, which you were referring to, is absolutely true. And there are people with Alzheimer's disease who do not want the word Alzheimer mentioned in their presence. 
And furthermore, it's not them who put the keys in the refrigerator or can't find their car. Somebody moved it. Somebody else did it. It's always somebody else. And so when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I'm beginning to lose my memory, and uh, you know, uh, uh, do I have Alzheimer's disease? And I say, well, of course, we can't tell without you coming into the clinic. But in general, if you think you have problems, you're much less likely to have Alzheimer's disease than if you think you have no problems and your <laughs> family are the ones who think you have problems. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Question is, what about the current drugs for Alzheimer's disease that are out there now? Aricept, Razodyne, uh, Nemenda, and uh, what they are is essentially crutches to help the neurons that are left work a little bit better. That's all they do. Um, they, they help in very specific ways, and what they do is essentially reduce the decline of somebody with Alzheimer's disease to a l slower slope than it would otherwise be. Um, and uh, yes, uh, people with mild cognitive impairment have had their slopes reduced uh, as well. But the problem with it is that uh, it doesn't really attack the disease at its root. Um, and, and that's why we need to move beyond them. Yeah, good question. Okay, I think I've worn everybody out. We have one more question. I don't want to send anybody away, and I will hang around afterwards if you have other questions. Yeah. So my question is, um, do stem cells play any part in your research at all? Okay, so the question is, what about stem cells? So there are basically two kinds of stem cells that we're working with now. We are not working with, but are being worked on in various laboratories. One is what we call embryonic stem cells, and those are the cells that have got a lot of ethical concerns because there are some lines that have already been developed that has been approved for funding by the NIH, um, and, and that's because they're already there, so there's no point throwing them out. Then there are the embryonic stem cells that come from donated embryos where the people say, yeah, you can use it, it's fine. But the NIH cannot fund research on those. But private donors can fund research on those. And then there's a, a very interesting type of uh, stem cell, which is called induced pluripotent stem cells. And they just come from any cell, your skin cells, for instance, your fibroblasts. And what they do is they treat them in very special ways to basically say, you should forget where you are, you should forget you're a fibroblast, you should forget that you've been living in a person for the last 30 years, you should just pretend that you're an embryonic stem cell. And you can fool these cells into doing exactly that, and then you can grow them from a very specific person into neurons or glia or muscle. And those cells are, are very uh, uh, interesting with respect to developing you know, treatments. Do I think that stem cells are going to cure Alzheimer's disease? No. And the reason for that is that it's a, a, a disease that affects large parts of the brain. A lot of cells have died. And to get a neuron like stem cell to go in and make all the right connections and to know what it's doing in the midst of this catastrophe is, uh, I think, going to be hard. So we're not focusing on that direction. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Potter, very much. You were excellent, as always. As, as Dr. Potter noted, the state legislature did donate, or not donate, but um, gave us $250,000 to start the, uh, the application process for a, a clinic full center in Alzheimer's. And I wanted to recognize Senator Nancy Todd for being here with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> And if you want to be part of the fight at the CU Anschutz campus for Alzheimer's, please, you do have these envelopes, and we do have someone outside who would be willing to either answer questions, you'll be there, and uh, tell you a little bit more. But uh, thank you so much for being here. It was an outstanding crowd. Thanks for your questions. I hope to see you at another event. Thanks. Thank you.